So the typical exchange goes, I'm from Massachusetts. And the response is always, what the hell are you doing in Salt Lake City? It's easy to pick on this city with its, like it's the slow fat kid that's always inexplicably striking out at slow pitch kickball. It's just desert and Mormons, they said, as I found out about liquor laws crafted by teetotalers with cover charges turned into membership fees, bootleg runs to Evanston, and Wendover fun buses providing escapes from church-controlled communities. And yet I came, and I stayed, and the question remains, what the hell are you doing in Salt Lake City? I came for the girl. The one who said yes to my dorm room proposal two days after dating 15 years later to find bets against the endurance of our relationship and residency, watching my children flower in this desert and finding art forms that challenge and humble me constantly. So yeah, it's easy to pick on the city for all its oddities and its jello mold culture, but it's just as easy to give in to what's good and push past that popular kid tendency to mock the weak and give that fat kid one more chance. Yeah. Um, of course, I came out and just did half of that poem. Uh, it's one of those things that just happens. You go, oh, I'm, I'm a performance poet, and I can't really like, go back. I'm just going to keep going forward. Um, and that comes down to a, uh, an overall uh, idea of push that's out there in the slam community. We, we push each other. We push each other to go harder. We push each other to go better. We push each other to just go. Um, and so that's why slam is actually kind of an interactive thing. So when you go on to the, the poetry readings, and we put on our glasses, and we read our books, and we say our things, um, a lot of times it's like, oh, I want to do polite applause. I, I, I'm listening to what you have to say. Your metaphor was well crafted. Um, but we also, in slam, we like to hear things. And so we, we snap sometimes. We snap. We like to what's going on. We clap, baby, we bang on the table. Like, yes, I enjoy this. And we, uh, we even say, I enjoy what you're doing. Please do more of that. No, we don't. Actually, we say the word push because it kind of simplifies that. We just, if you really enjoy what someone's doing, you just say push because you want them to go even harder and deeper and better and whatever is going on. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a performance poet. I come from poetry, uh, from theater, actually. Uh, so a lot of my stuff involves a lot of movement and a lot of presentation, but also a lot of grounding. Um, I also am a dad. My last name is Parent, and that is not only a surname, that is also my occupation. And I have a daughter, and this poem is not to her. To the boys who may one day date my daughter, I have been waiting for you. Since before her birth, since before my spark took hold and ignited the fire in her mother's belly, I have been training to kill you. When you were taking your first steps, I was preparing to make it so you never walked again. When you played at war, I was perfecting headshots. You can't catch up at this point. And when you first see my daughter and fall in love with the look, who fall in love with the look that she sends over her shoulder, her crescent moon eyes framing her laughing smile, you are going to want to talk to her. And when those hours pass by like sprinters during that first timeless conversation, you will also know, with a deep and unspoken dread, that you are going to have to talk to me. When you first come to my home and see the bone carving over my threshold, try not to imagine your own femur so expertly carved. Pay no attention to my ample crawl space, my room with the rubber mat and a drain. Be careful to only approach me with love for my daughter. I have been seeding childhood with taproot hugs to weed out indifference and apathy. There will be no there will be no daddy issues for your teenage talons to latch upon if you break her heart. I will hear it snap with the ear I pressed against her mother's belly. The crook of my elbow where I cradled her head will send a message to my fist, my cheeks, or a tune to her lips. I will know if they tremble. I have taught her that a man should never hit a woman. Now her mother would like to add that you really shouldn't ever hit anybody, but I have taught her that a man should never hit a woman. Consider my genes a mark of Cain. You will suffer seven times whatever you do to her, and she will not keep your secrets. You can't make fire feel afraid. I have been trying to teach her love all of her life. All I ask is that you continue the lesson. Love her. Befriend her, protect her, be there when I can't. 
And when my body gives up to the grave, let the grin that eternity carves into my face be a reflection of the peace that your love brings to her, and we should get along just fine. Addendum. <laughs> to the girls who may one day date my daughter. <laughs> my wife is a better shot than I am. <laughs> So I um I poetry is uh, slam poetry is not the first thing thing of my thing. I, uh, I I'm a software engineer by profession, and uh, so my left brain swells and bursts. Uh, so I need my right brain to be satisfied with something else. So I do improv comedy. I do a lot of improv theater. I've, I've toured nationally. I I got into poetry because I invented a format that uh, uh, uses poetry and music and imp improvised scene work, and they kind of feed together. So. And I became an artistic associate of the Chicago Improv Festival, and blah, 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 whatever. Um, but I also do improv locally at the Off-Broadway Theater over here in 300 South of Maine. It's, it's fun. It's, uh, it's more family friendly. It's short form, like whose line is it anyway? And we got an invitation to go out to uh, Nevada, 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 and uh, do this rodeo. Um, and at the rodeo, I saw there was this booth that said cowboy stuff. So I'm like, what's cowboy stuff? And so it, it involves a lot of hats and belt buckles, evidently. And so there was this belt buckle with a Confederate flag lined with German crosses. And I'm like, wow, what a statement. So I took a picture of it, and a Facebook conversation ensued, in which one of my friends said, oh, are you one of those people that thinks the Confederate flag is racist? And I said, I guess I am. Perhaps I'm missing something. And uh, it, a, a, a debate ensued of, of what was what and what symbology is. And one of my friends said, you have to understand that when a group takes on a symbol as their own, they imbue the sensibilities, the morals, the whatever, the history of that group upon that symbol. And it got me thinking about this poem. So, uh, and this kind of ties into a, what, a lot of what Jean's uh, work was at the beginning. Little brother, look what they've done to me. For millennia, I have woven myself into humanity's dreams, raised comet-like across their collective consciousness, as basic as a circle, a hooked cross, a child of lines and busy hands. Simple, recognizable, they call me swastika. And I was everywhere, even in the one place I wished I wasn't. I admit, I was jealous of you, little brother, and the star you rose up on, for I was just a hooked cross glossed over on cracked clay pots and deerskin teepees, hidden along with kisses on the collars of Chinese children, ironically, to protect them from evil spirits. All of Asia blended me into their backgrounds, Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, I could tell you where any temple was, a sun symbol, a heart seal, eternity, a minor celebrity at one continent, a child's absent doodle the rest. He took me west, little brother, told me to point right and lean, hold the pose, showed a bright white spotlight on me while I danced on a red carpet. They all waved at me, little brother. I got caught up in the rush to become a major celebrity. It was too late to turn back. We <laughs> slaughtered each other under my hooked shadow, the smoke of their flesh darkening my form. I let them turn me into something. Simple, recognizable, detestable. Humanity's dreams no longer I can trace my form in innocent doodles. Countless millennia may never wash away the stench on my lines, no matter which way I turn. A minor celebrity on one continent, a symbol of hatred on the rest. So many killed while I waved over them, their murderers, justifying themselves by the meaning they put into my shape. They killed. For me, you don't have my hooks, little brother, but we have the same parents, the same simplicity of lines. We have had different men who have defined us even if we have both been worn by popes. My body count is well over six million, little brother. Pray they do not 
start counting up the ones that were killed for you. Person number less than 10. Uh, Mark Smith kind of uh, gathered this band together. She was in that band. Um, when people go, oh, you know, people want to respect the mics, I think about folks like Gene Howard who went to biker bars, stood on stools, and said, hey, I'm about to do a poem. So the bottom line is my motto is that poets don't ask for attention, they take it. Uh, so if you can't hang, go, there's the door. Um, so that said, I, I think you really need to write what your passion is. And my passion, I, I have a few passions, and one of them is my children. And so this was a poem that I wrote to my son. To my son on the occasion of his eighth birthday. Knock it off. Stop growing old. You are officially grounded from age. I do not want to see another tooth shed from your mouth like some small porcelain treasure. No more gross birth to prevent me from having to bend down to hug you. I forbid your haircuts to advance past anything that is not vaguely bowl-shaped. You don't understand. Forever's in smaller chunks for you since you've only had eight years of life to, from which to build perspective. Childhood will last for eons with summer advancing in ages and birthday spanning eras, even recess will last the equivalent of one of my days. But my 30 plus years have polluted the perspective of time, and I am trying to hold on to these years with you as if they were water. I keep looking up and seeing this baby turning into a boy with every milestone, this bittersweet moment where I encourage you to move forward while lying down, clutching at your ankles, trying to drag you back into a crib. If you keep going at this rate, soon you'll find the purgatory of adolescence, and even worse, high school. And those years will drag on, forming center rings and redwoods, and we will be able to tell where there was a blight of pimples and show the lines where your voice went from soprano to tenor. And you will sit alone in a grove of other trees, knowing that the mighty shade of your father surely never felt the worry of wind that a sapling holds. And I will never be able to convince you that these years are a mere bump on your identity. It still does not know which way your branches will grow. Adulthood seems so far away from you as if stars will burn out and fade on your journey to it, leaving dark holes in the sky and constellations undone. And yet I see you speeding towards it faster than starlight, and I want to pull you over and read you your rights. You have the right to remain eight. You have the right to imagine adventures for all eternity. If you cannot afford an adventure at this time, Daddy will take a vacation day, and we will get so filthy, we will leave rings in bathtubs and washing machines. I am not crazy. I know that this grounding from age will never hold. I know that you will read this one day and you will be well past nine and he is. And I hope and pray that you do. Because the only thing that can freeze anyone at any age is a coffin. Just try to lay off on growing old so fast. Enjoy digging to China in the backyard and fighting off hordes of Sith while landing a million punches and never once getting hit. May you never become bitter or disillusioned at my wisdom. And may you never be afraid to kiss my lips in public. Hold on tight before these years turn to water. And as you go, send in your sister. <laughs> I have it from a reliable source that she thinks she's turning six soon. Well, we'll just have to see about that. Um, I don't always memorize everything. Uh, there's a very, uh, there's a slim poet I'm very fond of. His name's Scott Woods, and he doesn't memorize a single thing. And always slams uh, from paper because he says, while I, you are memorizing things, I am writing more and creating more art. Um, now, that doesn't mean that I don't like to memorize things, but every now and again, I just want to share a piece that I've written down. This is a, um, this is a, a piece about a, a reoccurring, well, let's just get into it. My grandfather waits at the kitchen counter 
Hovering over his newspaper unfolded elbows, he glances up and smiles. Good morning. It's too early for any cartoons besides Space Ghost and the Herculoids. He always lets me eat in front of the co at the coffee table in front of the console television. I am always careful not to make a mess. What do you want for breakfast, he asks. And I am expansion, barely able to seem in my joy. My mouth hangs open in a gaping smile. My eyes are glass cups under a kitchen faucet. I can feel the words damning against my voice box. I don't want to break the spell, but I have to know if this is real. I have to say them. You're alive. Papa, you're alive. He smiles at my childlike voice, his shape. Holds form, it worked this time. I can throw my arms around his neck. I smell his cologne, go back to my selfish cartoons, waiting for toast, powdered sugar, strawberries, life cereal, life. I hear a different child's voice. Daddy, there is no Slow fade, no smoky settling. My grandfather's kitchen is an event horizon. He is the center of a television tube collapsing into a single phosphorus dot. I blink away from my damp pillow, my four-year-old son in focus. He plays the game of kiss you awake. His smile holds, waiting. I remember to smile back and I scoop him up and I empty him of tickled giggles to refill the joy in my empty chest. We sneak away, letting his mother sleep headed to the kitchen. The cartoons are always on these days. I let him sit at the coffee table. I know he will be careful. I ask my son what he wants for breakfast. It's, you know, you know, just those dreams that you're just like you're so happy you have them, but you're so incensed when you have to wake up, and just that keeps happening to me. That that one where it's just he's alive, and it's just it's so real, and, and uh, it, I just feel so cheated when I wake up, and it's just what do you do with that? Um, write a sappy poem. Uh, I I also I, I'm, I'm a Catholic guy. I uh, I grew up Catholic. Um, and I almost became a Catholic priest, actually. It's a very well-known fact about me. I was going to go into seminary. Um, there's a lot of things that I think about. There is these characters, this beautiful storybook that is full of these characters that you just, some of them only have a dimension or two to them. And you just have to wonder, where are they coming from? This is not so, I know it's religion, but does it have to be so black and white? Um, so this, this is a poem that there was a, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, were, uh, when they were discovered, they found that there was uh, this gospel, this undiscovered gospel, the gospel of Jews. And it told a very different angle of, of his motivation. And I just kind of wanted to explore that for a bit. It is a different type of martyrdom to sacrifice your name. No father calls their son Judas. No painter renders me in a stoic pose alongside my fellow disciples. A martyr needs a cause and a public death. The recipe is timeless, simple. You had already played your case all across this dusty territory, made the wrong sorts of people angry. The risk to your legacy was a dagger in a ditch, a footnote of the confines of a single chapter, an anonymous death or a long life. We had to choose the moment wisely, you and I, and make the powerful think it was their idea to place you bleeding and scourged upon the altar. There could be no sacrifice without a knife to draw across the lamb's throat. I made myself sharp for the trick to work. Only you and I can know the secret. It made the reaction of the other apostles so genuine, believable. My betrayal left them stupefied, confused, so simple to think that silver was the motive. Shiny, distracting, no less distracting than a kiss. You pledged. 
to rise again and turn your crucifixion into something extraordinary. But I grew desperate in my waiting. I tried to tell the others that you were the man in the box and I was merely a tool for your freedom, a liberator. There could be no Jesus without Judas, no resurrection without a death. You have to make something disappear in order to bring it back. And it was a good trick. No one else knew the secret. They all were doubters, cast angry glances at me like stones. The townspeople found me in the morning, hanging, called me suicide. They missed the 11 sets of handprints on my back. I like to think that you must have shed at least one tear when you gathered your apostles together to show proof of your resurrection and could only count to eleven that you must have planned after it was all done to tell them about my role in your glory that you hadn't locked a lid on our secret hadn't meant to leave me buried unreason it is a different type of martyrdom to sacrifice your name no father calls their son Judas no painter renders me in a stoic pose alongside my fellow disciples I am Brutus in Cassius, a nickname for traitors, a taunt that all religions know, even the atheist. My death is a whisper hidden in a Gregorian chant, and yet they wear the crosses they nailed you to around their necks on chains made of silver, their hands clasped in prayer. My name scapegoat, a slaughtered lamb, your silence so sharp. So, I have a book. It was kind of a weird thing. Uh, I was approached by this small press named Sergeant Press, and they were like, hey, we would like to do a book. I'm like, oh, that's pretty fun. And so they printed a book, and I was like, oh, there's a bunch of my poems. And uh, I brought up, brought this up to somebody, and they were like, oh, yeah. I was like, well, how much is it? I'm like, it's $15. I was like, wow, what is it, like a coffee table book? <laughs> and I'm like, aww. I was like, there's like four chapbooks. And usually I sell my chapbooks for like 5 to $10. And like, there's four of them in here. And so I felt kind of like, I don't know. So I got a book. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I have books for $15. Um, <laughs> This is a this is a poem I always want to memorize and I can just I, I never can so I might as well read it. Why I hate this poems? One, they have numbers. Two. The numbers always follow a predictable pattern, one level deep, a child's trick of fingers and toes. Why don't this poems ebb and flow like legal documents with subsections listing letters and Roman numerals weaving like I V? Three. The act of listing segments the content, lining the road of your emotional journey with speed bumps and commercial breaks and the occasional nonsensical non sequitur that adds no clear value to, to the experience of the piece. Four, Junior Mints, delicious. Five, there is always a theme, but not necessarily a story. A list poem is a dictionary entry, defining noun, verb, and adjective as it falls slowly. A coalescing of chapters that reads more like a digest than a novel. Six, there is always innuendo, usually around six or nine. I don't know why, but it feels like a mutual agreement between the audience and the writer, a movement of the mouth that you can't quite concentrate on. Seven, there is usually a section of a list poem when the author is clearly running out of ideas. Your best bet is to put the weaker bits in the middle and hope no one notices. Eight, the writer spends way too much time weaving the linear list into a forced pattern, looping like a Mobius loop, trying to make you backtrack like a dictionary entry that returns the definition that got you here in the first place, a back and forth that reads more like a choose-your-own-adventure than a novel. Nine, sex. Delicious. Ten, you don't know quite where the list will end, but there seems to be a mutual agreement between the audience and the writer that there will be a nice round number, divisible by five or two, a neat package that brings it all together and completes the pattern, a brilliant crescendo from orgasmic bills, and if this, this is the satisfying ending that you have been craving. Eleven, it can never end on a prime number. <laughs> Which is a shame, because there are so many prime numbers, potentially endless, and folks always get excited when we find a new one, a bigger one, there is something fascinating about a number that is only divisible by itself. And one, twelve, I am not linear. I am not a thread. 
I am a spider web. I am a product of my mistakes and successes. I am fine detail, not broad strokes. I am no simple progression. 41, don't let anyone ever bind you into a pattern. Rise from all sides at once. You are the amazing of your dreams, your best moments rising crescendo. Accept that you are always capable of wonder. Stop expecting the other shoe to drop and walk barefoot. Stomp in puddles while eating junior mints. Count life in hugs and smiles, not numbers in simple progression. See, you are endless potential. No one can divide you, but you. Nerd poem. Um, so, uh, on the topic of religion, so uh, the Salt Lake City Slam team, uh, the last two years at Nationals, we have placed eighth out of 76 teams. Uh, I, I, this is, this is, we, are, we are very proud. Um, so, we, we tried something very different this year. Uh, last year, we went and saw this group from Minneapolis uh, try to do, uh, see the way that slam, slam is done, especially a team, is that you have rounds, and then each round, a team sends up a poem. So you have four poems from each team. And so uh, this team from Minneapolis, they did all these poems that were kind of related, and we loved it, but they did it very poorly. Uh, there, there just was too much reliance on each piece to link to each piece. And so we were like, Maybe we could do something different. So we tried this round, I guess guys, it's called the resonant round or the concept round, where we did all biblical themes. So we had a piece about Lucifer, a piece about Adam, a piece about Lilith and Eve, and if you don't know too much about Lilith, uh, it's an amazing character, and, uh, and then the answer from God. And we just had a great time with it, had a lot of great feedback from it. And this is the Lucifer poem that it all started with. <clears throat> Father, you made me Lucifer, created me from fire, and expected me to hold a certain shape, a certain ideal, to not ignite everything I touched, timber, imagination, rebellion. You should have chosen a different mother for me. I was made to burn, to shine a beacon on the horizon. I was a star in my own right. I had no tricks to turn wives into pillars of salt, to shoot arrows into the hearts of lovers, to be a proxy for your seed. I was made to burn, ignite. I loved you. You let me paint the sky around the sunrise. I could sing with the dawn without a sound, a beautiful orchestra of color for all my rebellion. I just wanted you to touch me, to stop playing a creation and take notice and touch me. You did. When you humans talk of my fall, you imagine me floating down a hollow tree towards Wonderland with teacups and tables, a comfortable chair. I fell like lightning, violent, a thunderclap of knuckles, a brilliance that shocks the eyes, and just like that, it's gone, my seraphim wings, as black as char, heaven's flame sent to this earth, this clay, this Adam's flesh. I wonder how your first fingertip child felt when he was cast out of paradise for a rebellion of the apple carved with his teeth and belly he just wanted to know you better I just wanted to show you how brightly I could burn we are your sons of fire and clay we both just wanted you to be proud of us father the sin just a little for us we looked to paradise once it was lost and waited for you to call us home to come back for us you did come back for one of us. Told everyone how the only way into paradise was through him. This John 316, this bumper sticker of a promise, but I will not bow to your clay idols, my halved brothers. I will come home and not do the spilled blood of your lamb. I will show you I am still worthy of your name. I will become a flame so bright for you, a morning star on supernova. I will steer my love for you into the heavens, Father. I am reaching for you. I still love you. I still crave your touch. I still need your pride. I will come home black as they may be. I still have my wings. There's always a little part of me that feels 
like, ah, blast me, blast me. But <laughs> I had a really long conversation with this guy after the feature about, after the Judas piece. He's like, you're gonna keep Christ in I'm like, well, hey, that's nice. He's the side character. This is a character expo uh, uh, inspection. Or you're trying to delve into what, what is this person, where are the multiple angles, why they did it. You know, Lex Luthor is not a great character because he's a single dimension. He's a great character because he truly believes that humanity is better than Superman. Um, that's kind of his deal. Um, and and, you have, and it's, it's his almost jingoistic approach to humanity. Um, so you want to try to like study these people and say, like, what else is there? So I've been doing a lot with that. I have something about Lazarus, something about Goliath. It's just been, I had a lot of fun with that. But speaking of fun, I am going to stop talking. Uh, and I'm going to close out with this poem. Thank you very much, Joel, for having me, for City Arts for having me. Uh, this is a poem that my daughter loves me to do, and now that she is of a certain age, it is almost painful. <laughs> Little girls, green sashes lined with patches, smiles broken with baby teeth, still dangling from gum threads, whistling lisp siren songs of would you like to buy some Girl Scout cookies? Each box of heaven color-coded so my completionist OCD gnaws at the back of my brain stem with Pokemon anthems. Gotta catch them all, good lord. I don't even like shortbread. The trefoils wink iconically at me, looking like American swing set crushes. The lemon jelly greens whisper French into my ear, making zest a word I want to work into my wedding vows. The Samoas are a good idea on paper chocolate and caramel, but the coconut tells a racist joke down the back of my throat block. It tastes like failed sitcoms. Little playground pushers, smile sweeter than diabetes. <laughs> the tagalongs are an afterthought, ironically just tagging along with the rest of the order. The dolce de leches are always a regret. Dry chalk cookie, surely your name translates into needs more milk. <laughs> the dosi dos fold their arms, sandwiching peanut butter like some sort of bizarro Oreo. We hate you so much. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> she twists the last knife in, like it'll earn her a merit badge. The thin mints, dear God, the thin mints, majestic freezer cookie, your serving size comes in sleeves. With it, I could dive into your abundance, swimming through you, praying for cookie gills, build obsidian statues in your honor. Praise me. I am too Catholic. I receive you like a wafer on the tongue, couple you with wine, make you a mighty maid of below. You to the barren winters of my freezers green with boxes that can barely contain your glory. <sighs> it takes weeks for my order to arrive. Three troops of little girls need to be called in to deliver the shipment. I pay with a banknote <laughs> and a promise of my firstborn child. <laughs> I pray that it is not a little girl. <laughs> Thank you very much.